Now, turning a, a, a bit into uh, the cerebellum, uh, I just wanted to, to shortly uh, link it also to uh, the behavioral level uh, because the cerebellum has been suggested uh, through a number of different experiments to be involved in motor learning in, in various ways. And this is one of the experiments and uh, we were supposed to have it also as the method of the day. Uh, we can see if we have time to do it uh, next week. Uh, but I think uh, several of you have already seen this experiment so I'm not sure that it's really necessary to go through it again. But but essentially, you should grasp the idea uh, relatively quickly. Uh, the idea is if you have someone who is quite good at uh, hitting a target, you give them prism glasses, uh, which move their visual field some degrees. You see that they start out uh, hitting uh, some centimeters to the left of the target. Through practice, they learn to hit the target again. But if you remove the prisms, they will now hit uh, some centimeters to the right of the target and after some practicing again they will uh, now uh, again uh, hit the target. This is a study which was done in 1996 by Martin et al. Uh, and it's been sort of uh, uh, the classical way of uh, uh, looking at motor, visual motor adaptation uh, involving the cerebellum mainly because if you look at different patients here with cerebellar uh, lesions, you see that this uh, adaptation that you saw before doesn't really take place. Uh, here in one patient, you see that he definitely hits 50 centimeters to the left of the target as in the healthy control person, but he never adapts. And when afterwards he goes back, he also doesn't show uh, Readaptation afterwards. Similar in this patient, this patient is not reacting to the change in the visual output at all, uh, and this patient is actually adapting to the other side. So uh, basically, the cerebellum appears to be involved in this. Um, well, this was never mind, it doesn't work anyway. I was just showing a video film showing this uh, adaptation, but I think let's not do it. This is uh, Another study in which uh, subjects were trained to um, uh, do a similar adaptation task involving uh, the cerebellum. So you have the adaptation going on over several trials here, 800 trials in total, uh, subjects becoming quite good. And then looking at uh, the changes in different areas of the brain uh, over these 800 trials, where do you see the largest change? And as you can see, this is the cerebellum. So the cerebellum lights up quite nicely, uh, suggesting that it's really the cerebellum which changes its activity over time as subjects learn how to do this uh, task. Uh, I will skip that relatively quickly in order to get to uh, what the uh, basic circuitry involved in, in doing this uh, is uh, basically the idea here is that um, what the cerebellum is sort of monitoring is both your intention of the movement that you intended to do and the actual consequences, the sensory consequences of the movement that you just performed. This is shown here for uh, a relatively uh, simple reflex basically if you want to uh, uh, focus on a specific visual object like my finger here and if you move your head at the same time you need to move your eyes in the opposite direction in order to fixate on the finger. So that's the so-called vestibular ocular reflex which is simply that if you have uh, some uh, visual input that you want to uh, keep at uh, a specific uh, point to fixate, you need to send input into uh, the ocular motor uh, system in order to activate the uh, muscles controlling the eye and that input comes basically from your vestibular hair cells. So if you move 
your head, for instance, to the right, you will activate some of the hair cells in your vestibular system, which will have connections to vestibular neurons, which will connect to oculomotor motor neurons, and therefore move your eye in the opposite direction. So that's the simple reflex which is involved, and which ensures that you can move your head and still uh, keep your eyes on target. Now the problem is, if that doesn't work the way it should, if the signaling coming from the hair cells doesn't move your eye sufficiently, then your visual input will become blurred or your eyes will move too much or whatever, and that will send an error signal from your retina. Your uh, retinal cells will uh, detect that there was something wrong. That input will be sent essentially to the inferior olive, which is a nucleus in the brainstem which sends these climbing fibers into the cerebellum where they can update uh, the input to the Purkinje cells coming from uh, mussy and parallel fibers, essentially uh, sending information uh, about the movement which was just being done in terms of uh, what was the intention of the movement and uh, the sensory feedback from that movement. And the Purkinje cells then have projections onto the vestibular neurons where uh, change can be induced so that this circuitry becomes more efficient again. That same mechanism probably works for all sorts of uh, different movements that we do with specific circuitry for all the different movements that we do. Uh, this has been demonstrated for this vestibular ocular reflex. It has also uh, been demonstrated for the eye blink reflex in the rabbit, uh, similar organization. Uh, in terms of more uh, complex behavior, we of course don't have similar uh, detailed information, but it's likely that it's similar uh, pathways which are involved. Uh, this is the closest that we get uh, in terms of more complex uh, movements. Uh, this is essentially recordings from Purkinje cells in the cerebellum. Uh, what you can see here is uh, all these spikes uh, that you see here are just ordinary action potentials in the Purkinje cells. Whenever you see these uh, much uh, broader or, or uh, uh, almost, I would say, uh, circular dots uh, on the panel here uh, signifies that they are complex cells, which signifies that uh, climbing fibers are being active. So in this case, it is a monkey uh, which is making a movement with the wrist against a certain load. And you can see that they are both the simple spikes and also the complex spikes being activated. What then happens is that the load is changed without the monkey knowing it. So from being flexor load, it gets load on the X tensors, but it still has to do the movement. But it now has to do the movement with a different load than it did just before. So it has to adapt its movement according to the change in the load. And what you can see to begin with here is that there's now quite a lot more activity in the climbing fibers as signified by these uh, complex fiber, uh, complex spikes, uh, suggesting that when there is a change in the external input and in the sensory feedback, then the climbing fibers are signaling uh, something changed and we have to adapt the motor program. Um, so there is evidence also for more uh, complex uh, behavior. So this is the same thing basically shown here that the monkey does a normal movement it has some sp simple spikes and complex spikes. Then we change the load, it gets more of the complex spikes, and then it adapts, and again, it's mainly the simple spikes and not so many complex spikes. So essentially, you have the sensory input uh, information about uh, the movement going on here. Then if there is a discrepancy between what the intention was and the actually uh, performed movement based on this change in the load, you will have now an error signal coming up through the climbing fibers which can modify uh, the synaptic interaction between the mussy fibers and the Purkinje cell. 
So you can look at that uh, in various ways. And one of the things is that you can uh, look at uh, how stimulation of the climbing fibers will change the input from uh, the uh, parallel fibers, muscle fibers, onto the Purkinje cells. So you can stimulate climbing fibers, you can stimulate parallel fibers, and you can record from the Purkinje cells. And essentially what you see if you start pairing these two stimuli, very similar to what has been done in the aplusia and in the, L, uh, in, in the hippocampus, you actually don't see LTP, but you see LTD, so you see long-term depression, which is, of course, irritating. Uh, but the trick here is that LTD in the cerebellum, in that circuitry, is very similar to LTP in the hippocampus circuitry, mainly because the Purkinje cells are inhibitory. So actually by reducing the input here, you get a larger response in the end because those cells are inhibitory. So just think of LTD in the cerebellum as being equivalent to LTP in the, the hippocampus. And therefore you can sort of uh, put up uh, that very much of the signaling turns out to be uh, s similar ways of uh, uh, signaling in, in, in many ways. If you go from the aplysia to LTP in the hippocampus to LTD in the cerebellum, it's to a very large extent the similar, a similar kind of uh, uh, signaling which takes place. Calcium has a very important role in old cases. You have this strong depolarization which leads to uh, release of calcium which uh, increases the level of uh, different uh, internal signaling mechanisms and you have various effects uh, in aplusia decrease openings of presynaptic potassium channels in uh, the cerebellum. Uh, it has been shown that it's uh, decreased opening of uh, postsynaptic AMPA receptor channels. There's also evidence of changes in uh, how many channels are actually being expressed in the membrane. Uh, similar to also what has been shown in uh, Aplusia. So there, there are many um, similarities in all of the signaling going all the way from uh, uh, what has been shown in, in uh, Aplusia and in other animals uh, to what has been shown in uh, humans. I did it! Oh, fantastic. <laughs>